I'd like to offer a big warm welcome to everybody who's joining us today for our Listen, Imagine, Compose um, CPD session. It's really nice to see so many familiar faces, um, lots of people coming back week after week. Um, and welcome to people who might be here for the first time as well. Um, so this week's session is looking at composing and improvising within instrumental learning. But I think that there's lots of questions about um, not only how it works in sort of one-to-one -one instrumental learning, but I'm sure there's lots of things to take away for um, working in the classroom as well and working with people who might be more confident as instrumentalists in the classroom. Um, so, uh, what did I want to see? I'm Judith Robinson. Uh, I'm Head of Education at Sound and Music and, and Listen, Imagine, Compose is a partnership project with Birmingham Contemporary Music Group and we're joined by Nancy Evans, who's going to tell us, who's going to be one of the speakers this week, uh, and also Martin Faultley from Birmingham City University. Um, we're also joined by um, a fantastic range of guests this week and, and I'll allow them to all introduce themselves when their turn comes up. Um, what else? Uh, so it would be great if everybody could keep themselves muted whilst uh, if they're not actually speaking during this session. Obviously when you get to a smaller group um, breakout session then it's easier to be not muted but otherwise we get all sorts of background noise coming from all, all these people who are here. Um, I recommend that you put your uh, Zoom into speaker view and then you get a big picture with the speaker or their screen if they're sharing, you know, if they're sharing a PowerPoint or something. And again, if you go into a breakout group, it's probably easier to be back into grid view so that you can see everybody more equally. Uh, and if you're struggling with bandwidth, I've struggled with it already <laughs> this, this afternoon. Um, we suggest switching off your video as a way of, you know, getting more signal and more audio and less. Uh, video. Um, we are recording this session and um, with the help of my 13 year old son I will have it edited and, and up on our Listener Magic Compose website um, probably within a week. We, we failed to turn the last one around in a week so he's now getting a backlog but um, I will be on to him later. Um, right so I think that's it. I'm going to hand straight over to Martin who is, is going to kick off Session with some contextualization for today's session. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Um, I hope you can see a PowerPoint picture that said, good, thank you, Judith, of composing an instrumental music. And I want to do a bit of theoretical contextualization um, and give us a few points to think about as we go through. If you've been to these sessions before, you all know the form. There's a nice quote from John Painter back in 1977 when he talked, he asked questions about what is music education. And he talked about musical education, which he said could describe adequately the training essential for anyone who's to follow a musical career. Music in education, he talks about it being much broader. The use of music in the general curriculum, school curriculum, so it can make a significant contribution to the education of all pupils. And in these Listen, Imagine, Compose sessions, we've been looking at music so far in the curriculum. And so what we want to do today is broaden that out and think about wider range of things. So I just want to say, when I talk about instrumental music lessons, please don't say, don't forget vocal. I'm, I'm, whenever I say instrumental, that subsumes vocal every time. I'm just trying to save the shortcut. But there's some questions we can ask about what happens in instrumental music lessons. And the most obvious thing is that children and young people learn to play musical instruments. Then there's a question that is often asked, does sometimes the graded music exam, the associated board, the Trinity, the whatever, whatever, does that become the curriculum in instrumental music lessons? And that's a question that's often asked. I'm not gonna answer it or even address it. I'm just gonna leave it hanging. A question for everybody to consider is, is instrumental music additionality? So we know about curriculum, we know about entitlement. What's the nature of instrumental music? Where does that come in, in terms of what can and should be happening? One of the things about curriculum music we've known since the early days of the national curriculum is the idea of composing, listening and performing as being the sort of three pillars that people talk about. Are there pillars of the instrumental music um, curriculum? And if so, what are they? 
Just a couple of quotes, one from Mandy Winter. She talks about the relationship between performing skills and composing. And is there a link between what somebody can play and what they actually then can compose? And she writes here, this does not necessarily mean that only experienced instrumentalists can compose, otherwise popular music styles wouldn't exist. Practices of informal learning would be evaluated. But there's often a point that's made and sometimes it's made politically that you need to know a lot and be able to do a lot before you can start to compose. Then from the other side of the pond, from over in America, where they do spend a lot of their time performing, Coops talks and with a very succinct sentence, comp composition contributes to the development of better musicians. And he then says that time spent in composition is an investment into their skills as well as the music program and students who compose become increasingly aware of how music works. And there's a couple of useful things to think about in that. Um, me and my colleagues at BCU have written in the past about that should say mixed economy of music education. It's that the education word seems to have been blotted out by the picture, but we've got these sort of parallel columns going on. I talked about the pillars. Well, the pillars all sort of exist, but don't, we're not entirely sure how they join up. So we've got little bits of link down in key stage two with wider ops, WISIT, first access, whatever your hub calls it. But then how does that link with, um, with the second pillar, I don't know if you can see my cursor, group individual music lessons, and then the extracurricular stuff that's going on as well. If you were with us last week, you will have heard Kevin Rogers talk about his work on musical understanding, and he took us through some of the history. And this was one of the pictures on his recent publication. And he spent quite a long time telling us how the thinking was that musical understanding was seen to be the outcome of what was going on here. Now, I think in instrumental music done well, all of these things will lead to musical understanding. So what is it that musical, um, that instrumental music lessons are contributing to musical understanding? And as usual, I'm posing a few questions, um, provocation type questions. And the first one is how, or how does, because I'm not entirely sure it always does, but let's ask, how does composing in the curriculum join up with composing in instrumental music lessons? I'll send all these questions out later on. Is there a school curriculum and an instrumental music one separately? And there, I think there's some issues with that. Then we've got a question about how do instrumentalists develop as rounded musicians? And I'm sure that we've all had the experience of the slide a few back where I talked about the graded music exam, the syllabus becoming the curriculum. And then one for us to think about is the, is the nature of does style and genre matter? Because I know that there's an awful lot of variety in terms of the instrumental music that's going on. As ever, this, uh, this presentation will be available on the website. Um, as, as soon as I've sent it to Judith, um, and that's me done. I hope that was my five minutes of fame this afternoon. Yeah, that's great, Martin. Thank you. Um, yes, so in fact, you've already shared the PowerPoint, so I can uh, upload it later. Thanks, Martin. Um, and to, I suppose, to add that the presentations that we have today do include um, from peripatetic teachers, um, who are teaching one-to-one, -one, peripatetic teachers who I suspect are also um, working in a wider opportunities context, and then also uh, uh, in a couple of minutes, um, Tom and Emily, who are working in a school and in a curriculum environment, but involving uh, what, you know, instrumental lessons within that. Um, so without any further ado, I'm gonna pass straight to Cormac Lone, who is retired now, but who um, was, uh, working for Birmingham Music Service and collaborating with Nancy Evans, who is a BCNG project. So over to Cormac. Hi, good afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all. And I, I thought I'd start off just by saying something about my background as a musician, so you know where I'm coming from. Um, principally, I'm a jazz musician. In the, um, the late 1970s, I earned my living uh, playing the saxophone in dance bands and um, I was very lucky it was a fantastic um, apprenticeship as a musician and I just kind of I was just old enough to catch the tail end of the that sort of dance band era when there were 
16-piece bands in mecca ballrooms, etc. Then in, um, in 1980, I started working as a peripatetic Woodridge teacher uh, for the Lo Local Education Authority and Music Services in the London area. Then in 1984, I moved up to Birmingham to work for the Birmingham Music Service as an instrumental teacher. I remained in Birmingham for the rest of my full-time career, and um, retiring from full-time teaching in 2013. Now, one of the many joys of my semi-retirement is, first of all, it's given me the time and energy to get back into playing the saxophone again and doing gigs. Up until, of course, all that came to an end in March, for reasons you know about. But also, and this is an unexpected um, benefit that came to me, through my being working only part-time, I found that I had the opportunity to reflect on my career in a, way, in a way which I hadn't done in the previous 33 years, and to reflect upon what things have gone well and what things I might do differently. And one conclusion I've come to is that if I were to start my career all over again, I would put composition right at the centre of my work. Now, I've always done some composition uh, with pupils, but I would say that it's been not quite peripheral, but it's been a bit of a sideline. I've done it sometimes, I've done it with some pupils, not all the time and not with all my pupils. I've now placed at the centre of my teaching, alongside improvising, and alongside performing music that's been composed by other people. And I think all those three things, composing, improvising, and performing composed music, they're all um, essential and huge, they're, well, they're a huge, they're a fantastic means for self-expression and creativity. One isn't more important than any of the others. But I think there's something really special about getting kids to compose their own music which is that uh, the children are exploring the instrument in a way they might not otherwise and discovering new things about what their instrument can do. And they're also exploring the components of music and discovering new things. So they might be discovering things about um, pitch, rhythm, harmony, musical structure in a way that they might not otherwise. And because of those things, I think that um, getting children to compose instrumental lessons can, can be a huge motivator for children. So I think different children are motivated by different things. For me, um, improvisation has always been my passion because I'm a jazz musician, I guess. But for some people, it might be composition. For some people, it might be playing music of Mozart or whoever. I thought, I think I'll just tell a couple of stories now about um, experiences I've had in the course of my career about um, children composing music. And first of all, I'm going to go right back to 1981, uh, towards the start of my career. And I was teaching Woodward Instruments in a junior school in the east of London. And I was starting off a group of eight-year-old beginner class pupils, four of them. Now, there was one person in the group, a girl called Bernadine, who I was a bit worried about because she had very small hands, very thin fingers, and I wasn't sure if clarinet was the right instrument. Um, wasn't sure that she'd be, that her fingers were big enough to cover the holes. But she was determined to, uh, to play the clarinet, and so we went ahead. Now, after this group of four pupils had had about two lessons, and they'd learned to play three notes, I gave them the task of um, composing a piece. So I said to them, I said, for your homework this week, I'd like you to each compose a piece of music yourself. I said, you can use the three notes we've learned, C, D, and E, or you can then um, experiment on the instrument, and um, if you would work out other notes to play, you could use those also. I said, um, you can give the piece a name if you want to. And I said, if you'd like to write the piece down in order to help you remember it, I said, you could do that. You could use the staff notation that we've been learning about. You could just write the letter names. 
spot, you can make up your own methods of notating it. But I said the really important thing is, please make up the piece of music first and then write it down afterwards, if you wish to. So then the next week, the four pupils came back and three of them had composed, each composed one piece. I can still remember that they were all, and they gave, them all, they gave their pieces descriptive titles, which I can still remember to this day. The Winds Does Blow, Monster Music, and The Water Sprite. They each composed one piece of music, apart from Bernadine, the girl with the small hands, who composed four pieces of music. And Bernadine went on in the course of that term to compose three or four pieces of music with descriptive titles each week. So by the time we got to Christmas, she'd filled her, her music manuscript book with pieces which she composed and notated. Now, after the group had been learning for um, about eight weeks, Bernadine came back with a piece of music entitled Jumping Spring Lambs, which I'm going to play for you now. And this is um, Bernadine's, Bernadine's performance of this piece in 1981. So after eight weeks, Bernardine had gained quite a bit of fluency over um, slightly more than an octave range of notes. And um, you can hear in that piece how she um, painted the picture of these jumping lambs in a field through her ascending and descending quaver phrases. Da 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 da. You can hear how she's um, used repetition of little motifs to create a phrase. Da 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 And then she's discovered the use of melodic sequence by repeating that phrase at a different pitch, a fourth higher. Da 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 And then at the very end of the piece, um, there were three, three phrases which, are, which suggest very clearly a perfect cadence. Chord five to chord one cadence, giving the piece a real sense of finality. So she's, so she's discovered all those things in that piece. But the other thing which amazed me, I think it's the third phrase from the end, it starts with a very secure, very confident low G. Now I would, eight weeks previously, I wouldn't have thought it possible that she'd be producing a low G which requires all six, six fingers covering all the holes of the clarinet. But I think it's because she's, she's passionate about composing and, any, and she was able to surmount any technical problems that may have arisen as a result of the um, fact she had really small hands. I'm going to jump ahead now to 2005 when I was um, teaching in Birmingham. And um, I'm now going to talk about, again, a group of four beginner clarinet pupils, but this time in year seven of a secondary school. At about this stage of my career, I was, I was getting interested in asking pupils to use a purely musical starting points, as opposed to descriptive starting points for their compositions. Partly, I think, because I've come to realise that my favourite pieces of music tend to be like that, rather than descriptive, partly because I'm a jazz musician. But I was reflecting on Beethoven's symphonies and I thought, well, the pastoral symphony is um, descriptive. You might describe it as program music. But Beethoven's fifth symphony is arguably, the entire piece is based on the opening four notes. Du -du -du -du. So I started encouraging kids to use a purely musical starting point. Now I went in to teach this lesson of four beginner clarinet pupils and I decided to uh, teach them two musical motives to use as a starting point for a composition. 
The first motif was um, a slow movement, a slow moving stepwise legato um, theme. And the second motif um, is more aggressive, jagged, staccato, repeated note figure. So I taught them to play those two motives and I said, right, I'm going to lead you to it for half an hour now. And I want you to work together as a group of four and see if you can come up with a piece which is based on those two motives. And I explained to them various ways that they could um, alter the, um, the motive, you know, start on a different pitch or whatever. I left them to it. I stayed in the room, doing, sitting in the corner of the room, doing my own work for, um, for half an hour. And, but I was available if they wanted any support. But basically, they got, got on with it themselves. And after 25 minutes, they came up with this composition, which I'm going to play for you now. Is, it's only based on those two very contrasting um, musical motifs. You know, the one very smooth and um, gentle, the other um, quite aggressive. And then the, the pieces of the conflict between those two musical ideas, but then it's resolved at the end with a slow moving legato phrase and a really long note that fades out. But it's interesting here as well that. Um, Again, the, uh, the pupils have just, well, here they've discovered to use sequence again, like Bernadine did, but and they've also discovered the use of um, in melodic inversion, which of course is, um, you know, a big part of, um, of Bach used that, Schoenberg used that all the time, not all the time, a lot of the time. Um, and again, for pupils who'd only been learning about eight weeks, that was a very clear, well-executed low G on the instrument, a couple of bars before the end. Moving on and talking more generally. Um, Paul Mac, I'm, I'm just going to interject here and say we've got about a minute left um, of your 15 minutes. Uh, sorry, have I overrun? Not yet, but you've got a minute. <laughs> One last sentence. Um, I could not count the number of times that I've set pupils' composition tasks and they've discovered what we call ternary form, you know, A, B, A structure, which has been at the you know, root of a lot of Western music since about um, the 10th century. Now, I, I never taught them about ternary form, but they discovered it. Then when they come back with a piece of ternary form, I say, well, you know, just you have one idea there. Then a contrasting idea, then another idea again, making them aware of what they've done. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Cormac, and I'm sorry I had to um, butt in there. Um, that was really interesting. Great to hear. Amazing that you've kept recordings from 1981. Uh, fantastic. Okay, um, so that we can maximise hearing from the speakers and not listening to me, I'm going to pass straight to Emily Crowhurst and Tom Bush, who are from School 21 in London, and they are going to talk to us about their work in their school. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, um, and thank you for that fantastic, really insightful first presentation. Um, so, uh, as I said, um, my name's Emily, and I'm head of 4 to 18 um, performing arts at School 21 and I'm here with my fantastic colleague Tom Bush and we're going to specifically talk to you today 
a bit about uh, one of our curricular projects, which spans from year five to year eight, and we're specifically going to talk about it in the context of our year five and six curriculum. Um, and the reason I think it's uh, really a powerful one to talk about in this session is because it's designed on the basis and the vision that we believe that if we're going to have instrumental learning, um, it needs to be for everyone in our curriculum. It needs to be authentic and it needs to be linked to the curriculum itself. So if we have instrumental lessons that they don't exist just as isolated lessons, but they actually feed in to our curriculum and the curriculum then feeds back into our instrumental lessons. Um, so our project is called the BAM project um, and it's uh, designed, we have 75 students in each year group. So if we take year five as an example, we've got 75 students and they're divided into three ensembles of 25. Uh, they're a big band, a wind band or a string orchestra. So they can be brought all together to form symphony orchestra, they can become small ensembles, etc. And so we're, we've deliberately created an authentic context for music making. Um, and then in these sessions, um, we do all sorts of uh, different musical journeys. And I'm going to be handing over to Tom, who's going to speak more specifically about how we compose in that setting. But one of the things that kind of makes this unique and how we're trying to sort of really build and develop teachers in our school is that our instrumental teachers teach these students in a two to one setting for 30 minutes every week. So every student has that entitlement across the week. But they also, our instrumental teachers are with us in our 100 minute a week curriculum music lesson, which we turn into an ensemble lesson. Um, so it exists where we might run authentic rehearsals, sectionals, conductive rehearsals, we do big composing projects, etc., cetera, um, covering a variety of styles. And the idea is that instrumental lessons are in that process with us. So they're in our curriculums um, and they're able to feed into what we're doing, but they're also able to extract that and then bring that into the teaching that they do when they teach our students one-to-one. -one. Um, so um, the, the previous slide that you just saw was kind of more the fancy slides of kind of some of our concerts, but actually in the next slides, this is kind of what it sort of looks like in the day-to-day. -day. So they're in these um, kind of authentic setups. They're working with instrumental teachers and exploring a range of things. Um, and the whole project itself is based on our curriculum values, uh, which we've got here. So these are five things that our entire 4 to 18 curriculum is underpinned by and this has been a such an important process for our whole curriculum design um, but it it holds everything we do to purpose and to account and and when when tom talks about the the project in a moment particularly in the context of creativity and finding flow with students hopefully you'll also see our other values kind of really permeating permeating through uh, so that's a kind of whistle stop background of our band project so i'm going to hand over to tom who's going to talk more specifically about the way that we compose in those sessions over to you tom um so hello um so uh hello. firstly i'm just going to issue a warning uh, halfway through i'm going to ask everyone to grab an instrument and go on mic which might be a little bit experimental but we'll see what happens um you'll see a slide when you're told to make a sound it could be your voice it could be a pencil doesn't really matter um, so, band project uh, as a sort of way of teaching music is sort of, is quite focused around the, the performance. We work towards concerts, um, so the children are learning to perform instruments. But we also incorporate composition in a large part of that to allow the space for experimentation, uh, making composition fun, and give sort of, uh, trying to give, like, give them the freedom to confidence on their instrument. I mean, I personally think that composition is really important. Um, because it helps to separate worrying about your instrument as a kind of an external thing to you and actually start thinking of it as just an extension of the self in the way that the voice is. Um, and so there are two main ways that um, we do that in these lessons and I'll try and rush through, well, well not rush through, but get through both quite quickly. Um, the first one is um, this idea called sound painting, um, which I don't know if anyone will have heard from before, was shared with a previous colleague of ours um, called Alid. Um, and it's a series of pre-arranged gestures for group improvisation. Um, and they were adapted by a guy called Walter Thompson. Um, there's a link to his site, it's called soundpainting.com. Um, essentially they're split into various uh, forms. So the most important one is this a gesture like this, um, which means ev absolutely everybody. Um, and then you'll have a, a sort of a gesture just to show what they're doing. So it could be a long note, something like that. And then when they do it, it will be something like this, which is go. 
Um, and it's really useful for beginners to sort of get to grips with their instrument. Even if you, you can only, you don't know how to play any different notes yet, as long as you can make a sound, everyone can improvise something together with a long note all at once and then stop with something like this. Um, and so there's a kind of demonstration of some of the various uh, gestures. There are quite a lot of complicated ones and we teach them kind of week by week as a warm up uh, to get ready for the instrument kind of, the, again, this kind of idea of the instrument not being sort of worrying about the technical aspects, but instead just just playing something. Um, we've got a demonstration here of some examples of what sound painting looks like, which I will play for you now. Actually, I, hang on, I need to share my sound. Share that again. Sorry. There we go. I'll play for you now. Uh... Um, so as you can see, obviously the, the performers are improvising in response to the conductor and the conductor is often improvising uh, a series of gestures. Um, the most fun part with this is where the students, obviously they learn the gestures and kind of learn how to respond. But then after a few weeks, you can begin to flip the learning and suddenly you don't have to have a teacher as a conductor and instead they can get up and perform and direct and give ideas. Um, and that's where the real magic happens, which sadly I don't have any videos of, but he's very good, believe me. Um, oh, I don't want to play that again. Let me just, there. So, um, I warned you about it. Um, so, I would like everybody to grab some form of instrument or get ready to sing if you're comfortable. Um, you're going to need to pin my, my uh, video to your screen so you can only see me and nobody else at all possible. And when I give the warning, we're going to go on the microphone and off mute. So, gestures that um, I'm going to teach you. Again, we had the everybody. We have a long note. I'm going to stand up for this. And we have go, which is go like that. Um, also, and then a really simple one, which is called the volume control, which is a hand up like that. And two things to make a V for volume. The volume is either quiet or loud, very simple. And the way to give that direction is I would go everybody, a long note with of volume control and then I'd step in either with a go or just like that to kind of give the volume. So if we're ready, everyone quiet, off mute, let's go. Let's see if we can do this. I'm going to go It might not work at all. This is the first time I've ever tried this, but teach you another one really quickly and this is what we call pointillism and that's kind of well, this and essentially just play random notes in any space and any time. Uh, let's try this all together so Okay, instruments down, uh, microphones off. Uh, that worked better than expected. Um, there are a lot more kind of symbols and gestures and there are things like sort of a minimalistic riff, 
Um, we also have uh, things like sort of remembering a, an idea. There's laughter, there's speech, there's loads of things you can put in. Um, the website is available. You can buy his book for $30 or there are ways of obtaining that for free, um, which I will not go into right here. Um, cool. So that sound painting, um, it's like I said, it's a great way of warming up. It sort of encourages the freedom of expression. Um, and it, it, it sort of, it, kids don't worry so much about the notes they're playing when they're sort of following, when they're kind of enjoying playing all together. Um, the other kind of way we sort of teach composition is through a format of telling a story. Um, and this would be sort of spending a whole single lesson uh, creating a piece of music rather than just as a warm up. Um, and the way we model it is with a simple story, we'll say, well, okay, for story, you need characters, you need a setting, and you need something to happen. That's the, the basic format for a new story. So I might say, um, who's the main character? The main character could be um, someone called Bob, and Bob sounds like this. Um, who's Bob with? Bob's with his friend Susan, who sounds like this. Um, Bob and Susan are going to the park, and something happens to them at the park. Um, somebody just shout out something that could happen to Bob and Susan at the park. Or go in the chat. Can I see the chat? I don't know. They got attacked by a dog. Yeah, attacked by a dog. Okay, and the dog sounds like this. So what was it? Bob and Susan go to the park. And they get attacked by a dog. And then they got home safe. Something simple like that. Um, I'd extend that out slightly longer as a demonstration. Um, but that's the basic principle. You ask who the characters are, what they're doing, and then what each action sounds like. They practice it, they put their story together, and they create something that looks like this. Once there was a boy called Max and a girl called Olivia. <laughs> One day they were walking in the forest. <laughs> an hour to get to, to create a story like that um, and so you've got quite there's a mixed range of ability in that little group and there's they've been playing there for about um, is it, so they're year fives and it's it still quite recently it's about six months into their musical journeys um, I think what's really interesting is that they intuitively pick up that walking should be bump 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 and on the trombone there's uh, the you know there's something it kind of taps into an instinctive way of making music um, I've got an example here that's taken around Christmas, hence the Christmas jumpers uh, of some year sixes. We've got to do a slightly more, more advanced piece that uh, also continues when the story's not playing. Um, it can be a little bit unclear, but I think it's called Scrooge Gets a Girlfriend off the top of my, off the top of my head. This is called Scrooge and his partner. When are you ready? Once upon a time, there was a you could say ugly man called Scrooge. He was coming out of his house and he was very moody today.
although I particularly enjoy that one because um, it sounds yes. incredibly cool jazz that they've been playing for <laughs> about a year and a half. Um, I think what's particularly interesting there is that they sort of follow the emotional state of Scrooge through as only kind of a few notes that they're playing, but there's they've, they've learned to you know building dynamics and kind of causing the way they're, uh, they're playing, and that sort of dramatic sudden stop where they all come off together was sort of showing really that high level musicianship. Um, that's kind of basically how we work um, to, to composition at year five and six level. Um, we don't really particularly too often worry about writing the music down in any form. The recording is itself um, the performance. With the, perform the, the, the performance is the score, the text. Um, I think the key thing is that what I always tell them is that a composition is an improvisation that you play twice. So they're, they're playing, they're improvising, creating a piece of music, and then by rehearsing it and repeating it and getting it to a final performance, it's composed. Um, I think Emily, do you want to take over here for me to talk about some of the year sevens quickly? Yeah, I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to just whiz through this for the last just couple of moments. So just um, just to sort of, I suppose, show the progression of the journey. So in year seven, we the students move into a band project scholarship. So we take sort of at least sort of 40 out of the 75 forward that would like to continue their instrumental learning. Everybody else still gets 100 minutes of curriculum music, but these guys get every Tuesday afternoon continuing the scholarship. Um, and one of our projects was about co-composing a 20 minute symphonic fairy tale um, inspired by Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf. So kind of writing program music, a really, really popular thing that teachers use and works really, really well. And obviously we're really lucky that we've got instrumentalists who, who have kind of developed that. So we're just going to finish just to sharing a few, a few clips um, of that, um, of the fruits of what they created. And if you just, just drop back just a couple of slides very quickly, Tom. Um, and we did a lot of this, or a lot of the composing through sound painting and through kind of just giving a few thematic ideas, um, which kind of sort of relates to the point that was made uh, by Cormac in the previous presentation about sort of, you know, giving a few suggestions and then allowing it to breathe and allowing students to explore. Um, and through that, they were able to compose a 20 minute full symphony um, based on the themes of Peter and the Wolf and inspired by those themes. Um, and there's just a few clips uh, just to kind of share that journey with you to finish. Tour of, of our curriculum, how it sort of embeds composing through our band project. If anybody does have any questions, feel free to like pop them into the chat and I'll, I'll sort of bank them and I'll see if I can sort of um, come back to you on those. But that's it from us. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Emily. That was um, really, really interesting. Really interesting to see how you've combined those improvisational and compositional things to and making it work in the classroom situation. And I think that that segues really nicely to um, Jackie Baldock, uh, who's going to talk to us next. Um, Jackie's a, a composer and improviser, and I'm going to uh, leave it with you, Jackie, to um, yeah introduce yourself and go from here. Thanks, Judith. Thanks uh, to everyone for those um, fascinating presentations so far. So um, very briefly, I'm a composer and improviser and I've been working um, professionally and also with young people for a long time, for th about 30 years now. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today um, about uh, improvising as a means of learning, really. Um, it's already sort of, uh, Cormac brought this up about the idea that improvisation can be a great way to help people support the development of their musicianship um, and that seems to me to be like quite a good way 
to link into instrumental learning. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, let's try and see if that works. Brilliant. You should have now playing on your screen. Is that right? If we've got that, yeah. Fab. So why is improvising a good thing to do? Well, first of all, I think it's an end in itself. Um, it supports a lot of different music genres from jazz to folk to pop to contemporary music to experimental. It's a means of creating beautiful and expressive music. It's also a useful process in composing. So I think on Listen, Imagine, Compose, we talk about this a lot, that, you know, the relationship between improvising and composing. Uh, it's a way to kind of incubate your material. Um, you, you were just in the previous presentation talking about having the ideas and letting them breathe. I mean, absolutely. It's, it's uh, something that kind of grows in real time and offline as well, I always find. Thirdly, it's a good way to discover uh, elements of music so things about your instrument so what notes or sounds go well together if you're improvising and trying out new ideas um, and I think that's the beginning sort of thinking about beginners on their instruments that can be the beginning of melodic and harmonic thinking so I like the way those two sounds go together can turn into oh I really like minor thirds or I really like perfect fourths um, and, and then when the why questions come, why do those sounds go together? Why does that sound sound sort of odd or surprising? That's the beginning, I think, of sort of an interest in theory and harmony as well. So, you know, this is a really practical way in that can ignite interest for some learners, I think. Um, I think lastly, the thing about improvisation, which is good across the board, uh, for humanity general, is it encourages what if kind of thinking. So what if I try and play this backwards? What if I finish the phrase differently? What if I change the rhythm? Um, this is the beginnings of an analysing music and, and starting to sort of tease out the component parts. So I've got my musical phrase, which kind of appeared from nowhere, and I, I play it on my violin, and this is great. But, you know, if I'm, if I'm getting stuck with that, how do I change it? So it does begin to help people into that space of kind of analysing uh, and breaking down the components of music. Part two, why is this a good thing to do? Uh, it's all about playing, I think. So again, we were looking at the idea of flow and creativity, and I think that's really important, and improvisation is a great space to develop all of that. Um, so I'd really recommend this book as a sort of entry-level uh, book, um, Free Play by Stephen Nakmanovich, who discusses the relationship between music improvisation and playfulness basically um, so for instrumental learners it can be a playful way to discover the instrument and the sounds and what it can do so Cormac also was talking about how um, for some learners it's such a great motivating way in that it can circumvent the, the sort of anxieties around your low G being squeaky on the clarinet you know it, it, you're going into it from a different angle and in a much more kind of playful way it's like I'll try this if it doesn't work it doesn't matter so you can get away from that sort of perfectionism um, it can provide a means for technical development so once you've learned your few note first few notes you can improvise with them um, and then you're learning different combinations of those notes you're learning your way around the instrument I think instrumental learners can usually play more sophisticated rhythms than they can read. So um, getting people into rhythmic articulation and feel and a grounded sense of pulse through improvisation when they're not learning about, you know, the note and then the next note and that, that slow sort of learning to spell C-A-T. Oh yeah, that's cat. It's a bit like that, I think, with learning to read music. Um, but with improvisation, you can go in more with sort of slightly um, more sophisticated or funkier rhythms. Um, and that can help facilitate techniques as well. So sort of tonguing and wind instruments, bowing for strings um, and articulation as well. Lastly, it's a holistic practice. So um, when people are improvising, they're usually listening really carefully. They're thinking about sound, which sounds go together, the physicality of playing. How do I want this to sound? You know, it gives people agency um, and that encourages people to be exploratory in how they're creating sound. So that touches on rhythm articulation and all the things that we might leave until sort of slightly later in instrumental learning. Actually, they can be there. I think, as most of us know, can be there right at the start. And improv is a, a good way to get that happening.
So the immediacy of improvisation, I think, is one of the, the great things about it in learning and especially for beginners. So, you know, you, you can bypass perfectionism. Um, it's quite good to embed that early, I think. Um, the ad hoc nature of it means you work with what you've got in the room. You work with what's available. We just did a sound painting composition with whatever we had to hand. Instruments, pencil pots, voices. Charlie Parker said very famously, if you can play one note and swing, you can play jazz. So I think what he's saying there is um, it's actually not about lots and lots of notes. It's about the feel and about really listening and understanding and, and a different kind of musical literacy, which is to do with hearing and responding with what's appropriate and um, just being with the music in the moment. So being in the moment develops listening and as you rely on oral cues to um, give you your next idea and the, the next response to the music and especially in group improvisation I think that comes to the fore even more. So I've um, got a few sort of ideas and examples of things that you might want to try. Um, possibly you already do all of these things but I'm just going to kind of throw out a few ideas. So this is for real beginners so people in their first term of instrumental learning perhaps. We've already heard this one. Choose three notes to play. The rule of three definitely works. Play them one at a time. Play them backwards. Try mixing them up. What happens if you add a rhythm? You know, so you can put these days, you can put like a metronome on and play to a pulse, but you can also put on beats and loops and play along to a little backing track as well. Um, one thing that I find is quite nice to bring in quite early um, is to play a short phrase and stop. So I'm quite into stopping and not trying to just keep going, but like a short phrase and then stop so that it just breathes and, and there's time to get a bit of grounding. You can play a short phrase, stop, then play an answer phrase. Um, so yeah, if the phrase has become too long and a bit wandery and noodly, you can set limits like just use, just make it a five note long phrase and just, just get the stopping and the breathing back in there. Um, one thing that, uh, I used to do with my daughter when she was learning clarinet, first learning clarinet, was just like play loads of notes, just blow the instrument and wiggle your fingers. So like just go for chaos. Um, and that can, that can kind of sound like free jazz when it's put over like a, a, a sort of quite grounded rhythmic backing. So it kind of sounds a bit nuts, but I think this comes a little bit into sound painting as well. The idea of letting the chaos be actually as just an exploratory tool. Um, and to have people feeling confidently that they can just make a sound on their instrument and let their, um, it's like the instrument is an extension of you. So it's like allowing your body to kind of do what it needs to do to generate the sounds and not worrying about the right sounds or the wrong sounds, the right notes, the wrong notes. Just go in there and, and let, let your physicality kind of reign just for a few minutes. So those are some ideas for working with beginners. Slightly more advanced players. Um, so when I was kind of thinking about the, the kinds of things that I tend to lead on to, these all end up being a bit more about working in groups. Uh, they don't need to be, but um, it's often just how it is in terms of being with a group of young people in the classroom or, you know, taking a, a small group aside to work together. Um, so question and answer, which is kind of like call and response, but you don't have to copy the exact answer. You can just do something a bit different when you do your response. It's quite a nice thing to do. Um, taking turns to be the leader and the follower. Um, obviously, those two things require slightly different skills. If you're following, hopefully you're listening and developing your responses. And if you're the leader, you're the one that has to break the ice and come up spontaneously with the new ideas. Um, a nice one to work with is the idea of four bar turnarounds. So you play a riff or a pattern three times and then in the fourth bar just improvise for a bar. So that helps develop a real grounded sense of rhythm. Also just playing something three times, it's like you play it, you discover it, then you rehearse it and then you perform it. So it's almost like a mini micro progression over those three times of repetition. So four, four bar turnarounds and the, and the it's a bit like sort of, you know, when drummers first learn, it's like we learn to play our rhythm and we learn to put in breaks every four bars. So it sort of comes from that thinking. Um, and then going down here, improvisation stems like question stems. So having like a few phrases or a few notes, rather a little phrase um, that you learn and then you experiment with different ways of continuing. So I might do, uh, never sat down and played a vibraphone before. I'm just going to turn that so you can see. It's a bit more friendly. There you go. 
so I, I might do um, something like this as a as a a sentence uh, phrase stem. And then I'm going to come up with some answers. So I do. This kind of little study, basically, which um, I'm going to show you a few different ways to develop that idea of the the sort of one bar solo the one bar repeated phrase a little bit later on today um last kind of uh, starting point to think about um thinking about modes modal improvisation so starting with four and five note modes doesn't have to be the major pentatonic folks um but you can really work with intervals um thinking about the modes and choosing those quite carefully so i've got a few examples at the bottom um so the first one is c d f and g so it, that's kind of quite an, an open kind of sounding mode neither major nor minor which is quite good Um, so that's the first one. The second one, a little bit more edgy, um, F, G, B, C. Um, and then the last one, uh, which is sort of quite lyrical. Um, so quite a, quite a fan with modes of like getting people to think melodically. So that goes for pianists as well. Um, so rather than it, it can get people completely away from triadic um, harmony and triadic chords. So thinking about making your chords just from the notes in that mode and revoicing them and exploring um, the sort of qualities of the intervals and the expressive qualities of the intervals in that way. So this is all kind of quite nuts and bolts. Of course, it will relate back again to inspiration and expression um and it's it's i guess developing a few sort of tools really to to go back into that much more sort of open and expressive world a few thoughts about getting stuck this is often part of people's development when they're learning to improvise playing the same old same old patterns and notes this is where your what if thinking can help so what if i play the end differently what if i double the speed what if i change the mood try it in a more funky happy way or a sad way what if i change the rhythm so play instead of lots of long notes in my melody um play a little rhythm on each note or add in a triplet what happens if i play a cross rhythm uh, what happens if I chuck in a D sharp or a, um, a dissonant note that doesn't go with the mode and, and then I give myself a challenge to kind of resolve that um, dissonance. Lastly, thinking about improvisation for advanced players. Um, so when I say advanced, I suppose I'm thinking of people that have maybe been playing their instrument for a couple of years, people that are approaching sort of the end of key stage three, thinking about key stage four. Um, and then just a couple of ideas for really sort of open and creative improv. So this is just stuff that people can do at home, really. Um, just have a, a bunch of postcards and images and pick one out, play something immediately that responds to it. Um, fridge magnet poetry, I think, is really great. You can have like a random collection in a little um, envelope and pick out three fridge magnet words and get three sort of random sounding words. They can generate rhythms they can just generate quite a sort of quirky feel that you can then improvise to and then on a slightly more sort of focused and technical note that these little studies so set your metronome play for four beats rest for four beats play for four beats rest for four beats this will help you get incredibly grounded in your rhythm um, that extends into playing for five beats resting for five beats and tackling some more complex time signatures um, within your playing for four beats, resting for four beats, you can set yourself little targets like always begin on an A. 
always start on the first beat, which is surprisingly quite hard to do, or, or never start on the first beat, or always play to land on the first beat of the second bar. So there are tiny little rhythmic challenges that you can set within that. Um, you can combine those. So play on an A and always land on the first beat of the second bar on an E, for example. Um, these exercises are really simple and it's tempting to just do it once or twice and then go on to the next one. But actually, if you keep doing it for like five or 10 minutes, what you start to do is break through your habitual patterns and then some really interesting things will start to happen. Um, and lastly, last suggestion is time. Yeah, different time signatures. So playing in different time signatures. So um, I think a bit later on today, Judith, I'm going to be setting you a takeaway task that you can partake in or decline um, but there will be a little idea for an improvisation study to have a go at after the session in the privacy of your own home right well thank you very much Jackie um, that was all really interesting and all, all of these powerpoints uh, will go up on our website so that you can take a look at the ideas um, and uh, sort of absorb more fully because uh, I know there's a lot of information coming out um, it'd be great if you could stop sharing your screen, Jackie. Um, and um, what we're going to do now is actually just take a, a little five minute break. Sometimes we've had activities um, during our interlude, but I think that uh, today we're just going to um, we're just going to take a, a five minute break just in case anybody wants to go and get a glass of water. It's certainly very hot where I am. Um, take a comfort break and we'll be back at. Uh, let me just check. We'll be back at 10 past three so that we can, um, we're going to hear from Tim Baptiste, who is uh, uh, from Birmingham Music Services. We're going to hear from Nancy at BCMG and then we'll have, a, have time to discuss some of uh, Martin's questions that he posed at the beginning of the session. So, Hi. Tim, are you good to go then? Thank you yeah, very much. I'll just um, share, share my screen. Um, just a bit of a background about myself. Um, I've, I'm a brass player and a lot of my experiences have been uh, across a vast area of um, genres of music. So I started off in the brass band tradition, uh, quickly went into the orchestral world and into jazz and various areas um, and kind of grew up with the assumption that everybody had that understanding of music. Um, and so uh, I arrived in Birmingham, went to the Fertile and then was fortunate enough to work alongside Cormac actually. Um, at the music service uh, and under Cormac we um, worked on um, how we could make music more holistic in our instrumental teaching um, and one of the things we came up with is something called the golden thread which I haven't put a, a diagram of on the screen because I know Cormac's got it in his book but I'm sure we'll be able to share it at another point uh, but it basically integrated uh, the four areas of skills, creativity, collaboration and musical understanding and put them into a diagram of um, interlocked cogs. Uh, and we wanted staff to understand that uh, in order to be successful in giving a, a rounded and holistic approach to music education, all of these cogs had to be moving, including creativity. So it's been great to hear uh, so many of the things that have been uh, going on in, in various areas around the country uh, in terms of spreading that news of composition and creativity being a key part of what we do. Um, I'm just trying to share my screen, so hopefully you'll be able to see that. Just give me a thumbs up. Let's see. You see that? Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I've kind of entitled today "Composing the Instrumental Teacher's Perspective" uh, because I, uh, one of my roles is uh, as an advanced skills teacher is to go out and work alongside some of our instrumental staff to help them to incorporate so many aspects of, of what we do. Uh, and I've deliberately put the sentence underneath under construction or under constant review because it's an area that I don't think we can ever settle on. It's always an area that we're going to be evolving on and, and just kind of identifying exactly what it is we're trying to achieve uh, in, in our composing world. Um, so a, a little anecdotal uh, diagram there that composing is fun and let's enjoy it. And uh, Actually, you know, let's not try and compartmentalise it or have differences, but actually just appreciate it for what it is. It's the bringing together of, of music. Um, so an essential part of music making is what I've put here. 
because if there were no composers, then there would be no music. It seems like an obvious statement, but it's something that I say to my pupils all the time. I say, okay, that piece of music that you listen to or that artist that you love so much, if they hadn't written those songs, what would your life look like? And if they always come back, well, it'd be quite empty, really. And that's how I kind of get students to think about the importance of uh, composing and why it's relevant to them. I don't know how many of you have seen the film yesterday, but I think it's a very useful tool to understand exactly how important composition is. Uh, for those that have not seen it, I won't put any spoiler alerts in there, uh, but it's, it's quite comical in that um, a young man who's a, a failing musician, I think it's fair to say, um, it, is in the world where the Beatles never existed, but only he knew about the Beatles and their songs. And so he sets about, uh, well, supposedly composing these amazing songs that enrich people's lives uh, until it comes out later on um, that you know, he didn't actually compose them. But it's, it's a very good anecdotal way of understanding that actually, if the Beatles didn't compose their songs, how different the world would look. Uh, so I, I very often use that kind of anecdote with my uh, pupils. And I always look from a, a perspective of, okay, what is the purpose of composing? Uh, and what are the benefits that we get from it? Um, and I think we all understand the purpose of it, but I try and get my pupils and some of the stuff that I work with to understand that the methods that we use are probably more important than the purpose and actually adopting the right mindset in how we approach it as musicians and recognizing that level of importance. Um, so with instrumental teachers, um, they, there, there are time restraints in terms of what they can actually achieve in a lesson. Uh, I worked out that if, a teacher within the service that I work for, if they have a 20 minute lesson and the pupils at every single lesson, that would be 11 hours of contact time over the year, which really isn't a lot when you've got to put into all of the different aspects uh, that we try and involve in our instrumental lessons and the expectations of parents and teachers and everything else. Um, and so I've always kind of taken the approach of let's make sure that composition is part of the holistic approach of what we're trying to achieve with our pupils and, and, and the lessons that we do. Um, very often I have pupils when they walk into the room and they say, uh, I'm not a composer, I can't compose, never have been able to. And yet some of these children that I speak to are some of the most creative and innovative uh, pupils that I've, I've ever come across. Uh, and so I think for, for us as, as teachers and educators, part of the situation we have is to help change the mindset of the pupils that we work with in order to make it accessible for all. And I was really glad that someone mentioned earlier that composition is for everybody. Um, and it's, it's just finding those tools to make it accessible for everybody. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, uh, composition consisted of someone putting some manuscript paper in front of me and a pen and saying, go away and compose. Um, I'm glad we've moved on from those um, places and that actually, you know, we can say, here's a range of stimuli, here's a range of instruments, here's a recording device, here's some space, here's some time, Go and explore some sounds, go and explore some ideas and let's see what we can pull together uh, in doing that. So I kind of uh, try and simplify the process for the pupils that I work with and say, okay, what are your intentions? What, what have you got that's in your mind? What are you going to do? And what are the resources that are available to you? Bring those together and that's, that's basically your, your formula for composing. Uh, I always use Bach as a kind of um, the test case. I say, if Bach was around today, I'm sure that he would uh, have very different composing intentions with a bit more freedom than writing just for the courts or whatever else, but also the resources available to him, I think he would have had a very different approach. Uh, and so I, I try and get them to think outside uh, the box in a very simple way. Um, so, so the context of, of the instrumental teacher then. So a lot of the teaching that we do is within the whole class instrumental teaching setup. Um, or it's in small group or individual groups. Uh, and so I thought it'd be quite useful for me to outline how we use composition in those various areas and those, those genres. So one, one of the uh, ways that I use composition very early on with my whole class instrumental um, classes is um, I use it as a tool just to understand exactly where the pupils are at in terms of their musical response, almost like a, a, a diagnostic tool as it were. Um, and so I, I, I give them a, a theme and I say, right, it, here's some instruments. Let's, let's go away and see what you can come up with with a, a free flowing composition. So I can just get a grip of exactly where they're at and, and where their musical appetite sits. Um, and I've got to say, it comes up with some astounding uh, results. 
there are some schools and within the city that I work in where um, that basically the, the, the culture of and the, the nature of the families that those peoples come from, uh, music is not a big part player in their lives. And so if you ask a pupil to compose something without actually giving them something to feed off, then that, that can be quite a, a problematic starting point. And so I like to assess exactly where they're at, what they've got in their, their minds, their musical minds, as it were, uh, and use that as a starting point. Um, also use composition within schools as, as a way to raise the profile of music within the school. Um, it's a fantastic tool for giving pupils that ownership and that's, that's um, raising of self-esteem. Um, but it's also quite a remarkable tool for um, saying to a head teacher, um, has, has your school got their school song? What do they sing on special occasions? What do you always go to as the kind of theme when you have a special occasion? And the amount of times that head teachers come back to me and say, well, we haven't really got a special song that we do. And they say, well, let's make a unique one. Let's compose one. Um, and so it really helps music be really integrated into the school life and really um, gives it a, a, a raised profile within the school. Um, we've, I've also done a similar thing with, with fanfares. So I say, okay, if you've got a, a school prom, do you have fanfares that play when people enter the room? Say, oh, no, we haven't thought of that. Okay, well, let's compose one that's unique to your school. And so it just helps um, the whole school to access what's going on with, with uh, a number of the pupils. Um, another favourite of mine within the whole class setting is to link it to the wider curriculum. Um, I'm so glad we, we heard from Tom earlier about sound painting and soundscapes uh, and storytelling because one of my favourite projects, particularly with the whole class uh, system, is um, particularly with stories in, li in literacy. Uh, so, for instance, there was one occasion where some of my pupils had to write a ghost story. And so they wrote these ghost stories and I, I overheard the teacher talking to the class about that's what they're going to do next after our instrumental lessons. So I said, well, how about we compose some music to enhance these ghost stories when they were performed in their assembly? And so they grabbed that opportunity. Um, and one thing that amazed me, I mean, some of these children, they're in year four and they're playing trombones and trumpets. Some of them are struggling to hold up an instrument, yet on these instruments were lip trilling which is a very advanced technique, particularly with a huge trombone in your hand. But because they wanted to create a particular sound, they found a way. And that's what really excites me about composition, is that when you grab hold of um, a children's imagination, they will always find a way to produce the result that they want to achieve. Um, and so the, the, the trumpet players were lip trilling as well. Um, but one thing that really grabbed me was um, the fact that I taught these children, they've only been playing a few weeks, I taught them the notes C, D and E, uh, which, you know, we all know is, is, is part of the major scale, but some of these children wanted the spooky sound and moved the E to be in an E flat. Now, I haven't taught them how to do that, they just experimented with their instruments, how can I make this sound spooky? And so one of the things that I find that is really liberating about um, composing is allowing pupils to have that, uh, that chance to experiment that chance to really explore those sounds that we haven't taught them. Um, and just watch with excitement as they develop their new techniques that I haven't necessarily taught them. Um, and so, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a key area for me in terms of um, composition within uh, the whole class setting. When it comes to small group teaching and individual uh, teaching, um, I, I predominantly use um, composing as, as I say, part of the holistic approach but to develop different areas within the pupils, uh, either technique or their musical fluency, or just to uh, reassess or re re enforce different aspects that they may be um, struggling with in their pieces. Um, so one thing, for instance, that I've been doing recently with some of my pupils is using the, four, the top four notes of the, the minor scale to have this kind of Egyptian sounding feel. Uh, and I've set them away to create a composition. So they just develop this fluency across these notes which for them was quite a challenge to move between the two semitones. Um, however, having made a composition using these notes, they found it so much more easily um, to, to be fluent in, in those particular notes. Um, and so I, I, I use it much more as, as a way of reinforcing maybe rhythm. So I'll say, okay, you're playing James Bond or something like that, but you're really struggling with the articulation. How about you go away and compose a piece that uses just that rhythmic pattern uh, 
And because they've got that sense of ownership, they really do uh, develop quickly uh, because they, they suddenly have more of an investment in wanting to succeed in uh, achieving the final results. Uh, and the same thing with, with key centers or, or scales. I always joke with my pupils, I, I don't teach them uh, major scales, I teach them to play East Enders in different keys. Um, and then I get them to, okay, Simon May made a lot of money from that composition using a, a scale. How might you be able to make a composition that could uh, be used in a similar way to uh, produce similar results? Um, so that's, that's kind of where I um, approach it from the individual and small group teaching um, aspect. Um, so I'm racing through because I've got an eye on the clock, so I'm sure we uh, want to stick to time. Um, so how do I start off? Well, I, the first thing that I do with all my, all of my pupils is I, I start by doing a process called horizon scanning. Because uh, I want to assess exactly what is on their musical horizon, as it were. How broad is their musical horizon? Uh, because I'm a, a firm believer that pupils only know what they know. Uh, and until we broaden that horizon for them and allow them to experience a wider depth of, of music, um, then it, it kind of challenges their imagination to imagine something they've never experienced. Um, and I, I know there's different ways of approaching that, but it's, it's, it's what I use as a kind of starting point. So I, I do that through question and answer and just sharing experiences. So I share my experience as a musician uh, and encourage them that as a musician, this is something that they want to explore as well in their work. And then I, I try and guide them uh, and encourage them through listening to various styles, listening to lots of artists and listening to uh, songs in different styles. So one of my favourites that I get some of my people to listen to is um, an artist called Paul Anker, who reproduced a lot of pop songs that are done by Oasis and Michael Jackson, but he's put them in a big band jazz style. And some of these songs, because they're in this completely different style, bring a real freshness to the song. And so I play some of these examples to my pupils and they go, wow, why haven't I heard this before? And it just kind of gives you that essence of, okay, if, if I want them to be successful in approaching their composition work, then I probably need to give them more of a variance of what they are listening to as well, and what they've been exposed to. Um, and the next thing I do is I um, give them access to a varied range of, of stimuli. Um, so I, I know we all deal with individual pupils, but I try and understand where my pupils are coming from and how they learn and how they develop. So for some pupils, giving them a picture really is quite evocative to them then being able to produce a piece of music. For another child, it's words. Another child, it's, it's having rhythm grids or graphic scores or getting them to compose using a composer's pad or just getting them to think about their local environment. But I just find that if I give them a bigger access, a wider a base of the pyramid, as it were, um, to access, that um, it gives them more um, ownership, more control, and, and gives them more freedom to then move forward in their exploration of what it is that they actually want to compose. Um, and I, I use a similar approach in the resources that I use. So I will get my um, pupils to play alongside apps. Um, so there's things like Node Beats. It's a great app that has kind of chill out sounds and say, okay, what can you play over the top of this? Because um, pupils very often find it quite hard to start from a blank screen, to start from a blank page and go, right, off you go. Uh, and so to give them that kind of musical stimulus or even that musical foundation that they can then build upon, I find it's really a, a useful um, starting point. Um, and I, I get them to think about the range of instruments they might use. So they might think about the instruments that they play, but also the instruments that they're exposed to as well. Um, and I know there's various computer programs out there and um, that they can use. And I try and bring all of this together so that it can say, okay, your composition doesn't have to be just on instruments. It could be a computer in the background playing and you're playing alongside it. Um, and so it just gives them a room for their imagination to, to grow, as it were. Um, I also try and model the process myself. So I would say, okay, I'm going to compose alongside you. And then we compare notes on our compositions. So we'll come together and say, okay, well, I composed this, what do you think? And so we have that kind of interaction of I'm learning from them as they're learning from me. Uh, and that, that freedom to actually input each other. Uh, and I think that's really important because I, I, I like my, my people to know that you never stop learning, you never stop developing, and it encourages them to express even more of what they can achieve. Um, and, and a caution we note really, first impressions really do make a difference. Um, and I've learned this, that if you approach composition from a, okay, um, you are going and creating music. We are just making music. And at some point we might record our making of music 
rather than let's get something written down. Um, it, it's, it's so much more freeing for, for them to express themselves. Um, in all of this, I've recognised that being patient and encouraging the pupil through the process is vital um, because there are some things that I might like and they absolutely don't like uh, and vice versa. But it's that appreciation, that common appreciation of, of their um, kind of artistic representation of what they're trying to achieve and responding in, in a positive way uh, is, is really important. And that kind of falls in line with the feedback that um, I give them, that, that kind of empathic uh, empathetic feedback that says, you know what, you, you can um, achieve something very different if you approach it like this. And they, because there's that level of trust, um, they, they are much more able to access what it, the, the ideas that you might point in their direction as well. Um, and so, yeah, that, that level of encouragement and questioning, uh, careful questioning, is I, I find quite important as well. I know someone referred to this earlier, I think it was Jackie, about the ask why and what if questions, the, the next steps as it were. Uh, and I find those very exciting. Um, because pupils will have something in their mind as to what they're trying to access, what they're trying to do. And it's when you ask the what if and why questions that they go, oh, I never thought I could develop it further, but you're absolutely right. Yes. What if I did that? What if I changed that, that feel or that, uh, that um, direction that I've gone? And then challenging them to think, okay, they can always be a next step. You know, I always say, you know, Bach or Beethoven around today, listen to their compositions. I'm sure they might add another movement. We might not want them to, but I'm sure they possibly would. Uh, and just recognizing that a composition, if it's alive, it never stops. Uh, it can always continue to grow, even when you've written it down. Um, and kind of my, my, my last kind of point really is, this is kind of the process that I, I take my people through. I always get them to think in bite-sized chunks. Because it's quite overwhelming for them to try and think of a composition as a whole. So I say, okay, well, let's grab an idea. Let's identify which ones of these ideas we're going to have. It's a bit like a tennis player, you know, when they get, they get thrown three balls and they choose one and they throw the others away. It's that kind of uh, mentality. Okay, which ideas are we going to use? Which ones are we going to select? We might have a multitude of ideas that we've developed, but which ones are we going to select as the ones we're going to then take to that point of defining, developing, refining? And then once they've got a, a kind of a, a, an array of multiple ideas then we start saying okay how can we incorporate these ideas how, how can we structure them and that might be cards written down that we put on the table and we put in different orders uh, so you can use different methods to to rearrange these ideas that they have and then the process starts all over again so okay we've got these ideas where's the next new idea going to come from um, and so that's that's kind of a, a whistle stop tour of a, a, a approach from an instrumental teacher's perspective so i hope that's helpful and useful that's great. That was really interesting, Tim. Thank you. Um, and I was also interested to hear about your diagram with the cogs that you referred to at the beginning. So if you do have a, a separate document with that, it'd be great to have it as a, um, I could put it on the Listen Imagine Compose website and then people can take a look at that because it sounded interesting. Okay, so I'm going to hand straight to Nancy Evans from BCMG now because um, we're getting a bit behind time but over to Nancy. Great um yes so oh it's been so interesting listening to everybody and I feel so much sympathy with what is what has been said and in a way what do I have to to add here really um like Tim my background was also in brass bands I started as a, as a cornet player in brass bands in the north of England and went through playing in jazz bands and orchestras and in some ways it was an incredibly rich music education most of it actually outside of the classroom but what was completely lacking from that music education was composing and improvising. And well, where improvising came in, it was entirely based in a, in a jazz, in the jazz genre. I don't think it was until I was applying for a postgraduate course that somebody put improvising center stage and asked me to um, play my trumpet as if I was going to um, into outer space and meeting aliens. It was something like that. I can't remember. It was about sort of uh, probably 25 years ago now. And, and I think part of why I do what I do now is because I felt that real lack as a young instrumentalist of opportunities to compose and be creative musically. I've been at BCMG, so I'm a trumpet player and I've been at BCMG 20 years. I'm not a, I don't play um, particularly anymore apart from in workshops. And I've been developing a program there that really centers on on, on them developing composing with young people and I've worked with many of you over those over those years 
Um, and sort of, you know, I just, what everyone's been talking about the why of this and I pretty much everything I say is very similar to what has been said already. I'm just going to share my screen, there we go. So the why. Um, alongside my um, career at BCMG, I also for, for a very long time was working with very young children as an early years music specialist. And most of my work was about composing and improvising with young people. And what Cormac was saying about, about children discovering compositional ideas just through, through play and not, you not needing to tell them. Those occasions when, you know, um, that they would play a piece of music and within that music they would have variations um, and nobody told them to create variations they would just do that and also what Jackie was saying about the sort of conversational idea um, you know you as the adult playing something the child responding maybe adding to it and then going backwards and forwards I worked with children from you know from zero to five when I was an early years music specialist and I saw that on a, on a daily basis in my work so even the very youngest children can compose and I would entirely concur with what everybody has been saying about about you know young people discovering new things through being playful with the instrument but also it being a way to practice some of those more boring things or to into or to consolidate instrumental technique rhythmic patterns ideas from particular pieces of music they might be studying and I think, I think this has also been mentioned, but you know, those kind of times where it gets a bit boring learning an instrument, I think composing and improvising can really help to carry some young people through that, through that difficult time. And I think also other people have mentioned, you know, mentioned like Cormac and Bernadine, particular children will emerge as differently musically talented. I've often found that it's not necessarily the, the best instrumentalist who's the best composer. And it, and it can just, it can really help to reveal different strengths from the children. Um, this next point goes back to what Kevin Rogers was saying ages ago about understanding music from the inside and, and you, know, a lot of, you know one of the reasons for composing is to help you know, you know how, how is musical material structured and developed why why are dynamics there why is the tempo changing here and then they can also take that knowledge um, into the mu other music that they listen to, 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 to as well. And of course, that then brings a whole musical imagination to their performing. They can then think like a composer as, as they are performing, you know, and they understand that this is part of the composer's imagination and they can bring their own imagination to that as well. Um, this has been very much talked about, the idea that they can be empowered to be creators. And I think maybe one thing that hasn't been touched on, but this gap between performers and composers is something really quite unique to the Western musical and um, classical cult, um, culture. And actually, um, many, many, in many, many different musical cultures, this separation doesn't exist. In, in, so I'm, gonna, I'm just talking really about a set of resources that we have created at BCMG in response to the current lockdown. There's two sets. One is for young people who maybe don't have instruments at home and the other is for those with instruments. And the intention of them is about just in encouraging playfulness for the instrument, um, getting away from the notion of composing as a linear exercise, with, you know, it's, it's exactly what Tim was just saying, treble clef, here's the manuscript, off you go. Uh, stopping worrying about the right notes, character gesture, those are the blocks of, that make up pieces of music. It isn't individual notes. The, the resources themselves try to offer a, a whole range of different starting points. Some of those are musical starting points and some are extra musical starting points. And sometimes in my work with young people, I find actually some children respond to one of those and some children respond to the other of those. And actually sometimes there's a very sweet spot in the middle where you give both and something really magical happens. Um, because of my work at BCNG, connecting to living composers is really, really important. And a lot of the resources link to composers. And, and you know, for children to understand, this isn't something that happened in the past. There are living composers around us today. And with these new resources, I've tried to be uh, very conscious about promoting um, you know, difference, that there's so many different kinds of composers, female, male, from different ethnicities, and that's very much work in progress, but I think it's really important that we show a, a, range, of, um, a range of ideas of what it is to be a composer. Each of the resources connects to some listening material. Of course, that's quite a lot of that is contemporary music because I work for a contemporary music organization. Sometimes the activities are directly inspired by that music and sometimes they're more loosely connected. 
And the idea is that they are accessible for quite different levels of, of, of attainment. Um, some less so, but the idea is they can be taken on very different kinds of levels. I'm just going to take you to the web page. Is that, is that showing the web page? No? Okay, hang on. Let me, let me just stop the share and I'm going to reshare and do that. Can you see it now? Yep, great. Um, because this was a very much a response to lockdown, some of the, the topics, uh, you know, things that you could be inspired by that were around you, whether that was birdsong, it was a, a skylines or clouds in the sky. Um, and just to sort of show you what the resources look like inside. So this relates, I guess, to some of the ideas that we've heard already about sort of working with what the children already know and finding different ways to, to play with that. So this one's called Borrow or Steal. And the listening material is um, Mark Anthony Turnage's version of um, Beyonce's Single Ladies and a version uh, and a kind of reworking of Cardiac Arrest by Madness by Thomas Adez. Um, so sort of the idea that the composers all the time are borrowing and stealing from each other's ideas. Uh, and the notion that whatever the children are studying at that moment, they could use that particular piece. And of course, then they, those are the notes they're learning and they can start to play around with that, break it up, turn it upside down, stretch it, etc. So this is one which has got, you know, quite a sort of musical starting point. Some, some of you might recognize this from the project I did with Cormac years ago, Imagine Compose, the kind of idea of exploding a song and re remaking it. On a very different, just very quickly, I'll just show you one other of these. Um, so Skylines basically takes, you, you trace the line of your, what you can see out of your, out of your lockdown on space and uses that line as, as, a, as a musical line to follow pitch going up and down. And then cloud gazing, the idea of looking at clouds, the shape of the clouds, watching how they change in terms of their color, the light, their density, or what environment that they might, they might be in. Um, the, the sort of listening material for the cloud gazing one is a beautiful piece by the composer Jonathan Harvey called Cirrus Light. And he talks about sitting in his armchair and watching um, Cirrus clouds moving and changing. So, you know, the, these, there's some, so some are much more poetical in, in their in sort of intention and others are much more kind of musically focused. But very much, you know, trying to, to reach young people at very different levels. You know, somebody at grade eight could be inspired by the shape of a cloud. Somebody who's just picked up an instrument could think about how they might realize the shape of a cloud too. Um, so yeah, the real intention is to, that it can be accessed by a whole different, different levels of young people on different instruments. You know, here we use code as bird song, um, the idea of finding, finding new sounds on your instrument. Um, what else? There's stories and then there's some sort of simple guides and, and Q&As with composers BCMG has worked with. I will make sure that the link to this part of the website um, is made available, but um, please do take a look and any questions about it, um, please, please come back to me. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And would you like to unshare your screen again? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> lovely. Okay. So um, uh, that that was all really interesting, and actually, we will make sure that the link to um, uh, sorry, I'm distracted by messages and things appearing on the screen. But we will make sure that we have um, shared the link to your resources, Nancy. And it's amazing you've been doing one a week all through lockdown, and you're still coming up with creative ideas. It's extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> Two a week, actually. Yeah, crazy. Um, yeah. So we, I, I kind of let the sessions, the, the contributions flow a bit and run over because it was also interesting. Um, but it does mean I'm afraid we're not going to have time for, for going out into dis discussion groups and, and talking about Martin's questions. So um, I'm sorry about that. I think it's probably on such a hot day, more important that we finish on time um, and preserve what, what sort of uh, 
what brain we have. Um, so um, I'm going to go straight on to, um, I'm actually going to go back to Jackie. Uh, and, and me and Jackie are going to sort of do the last little bit. We've got a sort of challenge um, for you to do um, over the weekend, which is around sort of improvising and creating your own music. And we very much hope that you'll have a go at this challenge and then um, uh, actually send in some sound files to me. Uh, you, if you've been to previous sessions, you remember that people have had to go at composing things. People, there was a delay, making a piece using delay on, on a uh, door one week. Uh, we crowdsourced some ideas for composing clubs last week, which are now on the website. Um, so this is this week's creative challenge. And if hopefully we'll get some videos of people performing their challenges that we can um, share with you next week in the interlude. So um, Nancy, I need you to mute yourself, please. Uh, just yeah. Oh, there's a, a strange thing going on where I. Okay, and I'm going to hand over to Jackie and I'm going to share my screen so that we can see um, the sort of the, uh, the things that Jackie has prepared. So uh, okay, so it's, um, I guess my, my sort of feeling about things is it's been so fascinating to listen to everyone and your experiences, which are much more granular than mine because the, the focus is with, you know, the same children that you develop and work with over such a long period it's really interesting to hear it um and i guess what i've brought to the table today is my experience as an improviser um so i guess i wouldn't be here if i didn't improvise um and didn't have something to offer so i guess my feeling about teaching um in my own work and and i guess i'd recommend it for anyone really is is you bring your musicianship to the table so this is this is something for you, um, a task to um, develop your improvising or to have a go at, at this to kind of see how it develops your improvising, see, see how you get on with it, really. Um, the main idea with it is you say what you need to say very quickly. So it goes back to what I was talking about earlier of one bar improvisations. And I've created, here we go, a, a little structure for you to work with. Um, so first of all, you set up a beat. Uh, use a loop or use a metronome 60 bpm is a good place to start but do what do what feels good for you um this structure of the piece goes like this it goes play for a bar rest for a bar play for a bar rest for a bar play for four bars rest for a bar so what we've got in here is going from very short to longer we're looking at development here within an improvisation study so it's it's this is a quite a high level in a way, I suppose. Um, so there's an additional challenge, which is about starting on the first beat of the bar and stopping before the end of the bar. So being very strict about the time to just really get you thinking um, in a, a very controlled way about where you are in the bar. Um, and then you can do things like restrict the pitch for yourself. You can choose a key or a mode or play completely atonally or just play sound um, as you wish, really, as the moment takes you. So Judith, if we can scroll down a little bit there. Yeah. So um, what I've done is set up a basic, very, very basic re recorded backing track, which you will be able to download. And we've got the link on the screen there, which yeah. Judith kindly put in. Um, and it's, it's to kind of accompany you on this study, basically. And it works like this. Vibraphone plays for a bar. You play for a bar. Vibraphone plays for a bar. You play for a bar. Vibraphone, four bars. And then we play together for a bar. We just play the backing rhythm. Um, and then it flips. You play for a bar. The vibraphone plays for a bar. You play for a bar. Vibraphone for a bar. You play for four bars. And then we both play the unison backing rhythm for a bar. Um, the unison is the drum pattern that I'm playing on A's. I think I managed to stick to just A's. I might have slung a few other notes in there, so sorry about that. Um, and basically the vibes are playing in A minor. You can go with this or you can be more exploratory. So we'd like to challenge you, if you're coming next week um, or if you're not coming next week, have a go at this. And ideally you can either play this on one device, play along with it and record yourself on another device. Have a few goes, listen back send us the best one or the other way to do it of course is to use a, a door a digital workstation so you upload to your door program 
um, and then record yourself playing on an additional audio track. So something like GarageBand or Reaper or Logic or um, whatever you're using. Um, and I've got a few ideas about free ones if anyone is interested and wants, wants to kind of try that out and hasn't tried that out before. Um, so I think that's it. I, um, maybe this is a good time. Just bung any questions in the chat if anything of that isn't clear or needs um, any further kind of elucidation. But yeah, you can download the backing track and um, give it a go. See how you get on. Uh, so we have uh, we've got a question. Um, so Adam says, should it be uh, a video file or a sound file? I think it's up to you. It, I mean, I can video would be fun, but on the other hand, I can appreciate that not everybody wants to um, um, sort of expose themselves like that. So if they, if you'd prefer to produce a sound file, we can do either and play either back, um, whatever suits you. Um, and then there's a question, could you put the link in the chat box, please? The link to the SoundCloud? I, what I was gonna do actually was to put that whole PDF with the instructions on the Listen Imagine Compose website. Oh no, you didn't want me to do, you didn't want me to share it publicly. I will make sure that you all get that information so that you've got the whole process, um, probably through an Eventbrite email um, after this. I'm um, less worried since I re-recorded the backing, actually. So um, okay. if, do, <laughs> if that's easier and the best way to access it, then then go for it. Definitely. It's really yeah. not perfect, I have to say. But um, yeah, it's all right. Yeah. OK, right. OK, so I think that's hopefully answered the questions. And then um, I think it just remains for me to sort of wrap up this session then and, and to thank everybody. It's been a really sort of rich and interesting um, session and, and so great to hear about how instrumental learning and composing has is sort of kind of being brought together in some really innovative ways. Uh, and especially on the back of, um, we had a presentation from Kevin Rogers last week who was talking about um, sort of musical understanding and how he I think it was in a slide that Martin shared at the beginning but you know how how you know what is the aim of music education and that it's more than learning to play a musical instrument and that composing is such a key part of of um, sort of gaining that musical understanding so I feel like this has really added to the conversation started last week um, so I will get PowerPoints from everybody, put them on the Listen Magic Compose website, share all the links, um, edit this video so that you can refer back to it. Um, I wanted to plug uh, Sound and Music Summer School. We've got a summer school for young composers aged 14 to 18. It's a digital online thing uh, and we still have a few places left. So if you know of any pupils of that age who would be interested, uh, do pass on that information. I'll put a link to it. and also. Uh, to mention again that um, this Imagine Compose has an accredited CPG course which uh, is at master's level um, and we're looking for people to um, uh, who are interested in studying that starting in the autumn. Uh, I think that's everything so I'm going to um, wish you a good day and go and get a drink uh, go and cool down and enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully see you all again next week. Okay. Bye for now then.